Hey everybody, happy Tuesday. It is Tuesday, so that means Twitch tonight. Uh, I have started clipping brief snippets of my um, Twitch uh, content and putting them on YouTube. Uh, should I put the entire streams on YouTube? They are two to three hours long. I didn't think any would be interest interested in viewing them. Uh, but if there are people who are interested in watching three-hour Twitch streams on YouTube, it's no skin off my nose to export them. Twitch makes it really easy. So please leave a comment if uh, you you are interested in this kind of content on YouTube. I stopped streaming on YouTube because they, de they uh, yanked my streaming privileges during E3 over bullshit. So I'm like, screw you, I'm going to Twitch. Their monetization model is better and come on camera focus. So if there is interest in it, it's no skin off my nose. It's really easy to port the whole thing over. So please let me know. Um, also, uh, people were pretty clear in yesterday's comments that they hate the 12 days of Christmas and me being a Canadian. It's like, how can you hate the 12 days of Christmas? Bob and Dumb McKenzie version. Seriously, on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a beer. You have to like the 12 days of Christmas in Canada. So I will not be doing the 12 days of Christmas. It was just people were so, oh God, no. So I won't, but I do have the first Christmas inspired Patreon song. It's the, it's the big closer on Old Holy Night. We're going to start with a bang. Let's go to church. Okay, ready? Join Patreon and help me make videos. Oh, Patreon dot com slash Lee Hannah K Patreon Patreon oh join join Patreon got a little bit of extension in there that time you guys like the belting so I'm doing more belting even though it totally freaks me out um, that is a story for another time. Maybe I'll tell the story of my singing in public phobia on Patreon. That sounds like a good idea, considering I've started doing it recorded, um, for Patreon, literally singing for my supper. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about something that, uh, I started thinking about playing Death Stranding. What else? I love this game. I cannot help it. And I've become obsessed with the data entries, the interviews and stuff like that in the game. And also being completely perplexed at why people have trouble following what's going on in the game. It's one of those games where people say it's confusing and at the end they don't know what's going on. Um, I am having no problem with what is going on in the game. None. But then I realized something. I'm older. I maintain, this is one of my crazy theories. One is... Star Wars episode one was the period where the world went to shit. I'm not saying it's causal. It just correlates with everything going to fucking crap. Star Wars episode one, I believe the Phantom Menace. I try not to remember the subtitles. Um, but uh, my other is that the Wrath of Khan was possibly Star Trek, the Wrath of Khan, the first one, was possibly the last literate movie released in cinemas. There might be ones like big budget action, like popcorn film. And central to understanding Wrath of Khan is the bookshelf in Khan's little private quarters that they find early in the film. And there's a bunch of books on that shelf, the, the most prominent of which was Milton's Paradise Lost. Now, back in that day, they could assume that a substantial number of people seeing the movie would have read or at least been aware of books like Moby Dick and Paradise Lost and those great classics of literature that people treat as perfect. They're really not. They're just really, really good. Nowadays, we cannot, um, we cannot rely on a common understanding that way. Hello, Momo. Have you read Moby Dick? Would you like to come up and say hi to people? Do you want to say hi, Momo? We're talking about we're talking about literature. You're smart. Come here. Whoops. Whoops. I just broke a coffee cup. Whoopsie. 
Um, okay, so here's Momo and a, a broken coffee cup. The, uh, the handle broke. Um, good thing it was empty. Uh, but, uh, hello, Momo. Hi. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, that shelf tells you what you need to know about why Star Trek suddenly got so freaking dark. It was Kirk's version of Paradise Lost. Now, that's what people going into Star Trek Wrath of Khan understood when the movie came out. But something else came out of that movie, the Kobayashi Maru test. And that meme of a test you, it, it, that teaches you how to learn how to fail, you have to choose how you're going to fail, that, that uh, uh, Kirk cheated on, he, he rigged, and so he went on to have his own Kobe Ashimaru, because in real life, sometimes you do fail and you have to learn how to fail. That meme of the Kobe Ashimaru has been more, more lingering, more lasting in modern pop culture than the metaphors in Wrath of Khan. And the thing that makes Wrath of Khan a great film is the metaphors. They have they utilize Paradise Lost and Moby Dick and then submarine battle cinema. Those really silent portions where they're, because there's no sound in space, they were using like submarine battle cinematics to make, to make spaceship fights exciting for people in cinemas in a way that isn't the space opera version of Star Wars, which is the very, very silly pew, pew, pew sounds in space, right? They were distinguishing themselves as the more sort of hard science fiction, more realistic, as if dilithium crystals can actually allow you to warp. Uh, but that, that was the point. Now, like I said, the meme of the Kobayashi Maru, in popular understanding, has outlived the metaphors in Wrath of Khan. And so now audiences who see that movie now cannot be expected to know from uh, certainly not Paradise Lost, possibly not Moby Dick. Apparently people under a certain age don't even know what the word malarkey means, which throws me off because I got told I was full of malarkey by my grandmother so many times. I didn't actually know the word was Irish, but I thought it might be Yiddish, but uh, by context, you knew you were full of crap. That's what malarkey meant. Um, and on the one hand, common memes are, are, are problematic in social justice speak because of the fact that English literature has been, or European literature, because, you know, the Count of Monte Cristo and, and Les Miserables and all that stuff, those are considered great literature where some more Eastern, um, uh, Eastern works are less well known in the West, unless you're talking about, you know, Sun Tzu's The Art of War, Ancient Art of War, that kind of stuff. Uh, Confucius, uh, not even Confucius anymore, my Lord. But we cannot expect audiences now to be educated in common works of literature. We no longer have that standardization. And so memes have replaced metaphors. And now I have to make sure that I define memes and metaphors so people don't freak out on me. So I'm just going to use Wikipedia. So here we go. Meme is an idea, behavior, or style that spreads from person to person within a culture, often with the aim of conveying a particular phenomenon, theme, or meaning represented by the meme. Some of you may not know that the word meme was coined by Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene way back in the 1970s. Um, and there was, there was a debate um, then at the time. One of the things that Dawkins backed up was Humphrey's suggestion that memes should be, I'm reading, considered as living structures, not just metaphorically, and proposed to regard memes as physically residing in the brain. Um, and he kind of walked that back a little bit, but that's where we get into this thing. And this is where I, I, I take issue with some of the followers of Dawkins, where they, they put a hierarchy of meaning on things. And I, I'm not trying to sound like Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson borrowed most of his best ideas, if not all of them. And yes, I know I'm stepping into maps of meaning territory right now. Um, but 
the idea of a meme as a living, living structure and not just metaphorical implies that memes are somehow superior to metaphors because they are l meaningful things. They are literal things and not just flights of fancy. What does a metaphor mean? A metaphor means... A metaphor is a figure of speech that, for rhetorical effect, refers to one thing by mentioning another. It may provide or obscure clarity or identify hidden similarities between two ideas. Metaphors are often compared to other types of figurative language, such as antithesis, hyperbole, metonymity, and simile. One of the most common cited examples of metaphor in English literature comes from all the words of stage, a monologue from As You Like It. Uh, and they show Puck, um, Puck Magazine, Political Magazine, which was something my stepfather um, introduced me to. That and Punch Magazine were two things that he was very big on. And Puck is a political satire magazine. And I think part of the fall of satire has been the fall of metaphor being replaced by memes. Um, people don't know how to handle things that aren't literal, such as satire and metaphor in an age where literal doesn't mean literal anymore. Literally now means figuratively, and what does that mean for our understanding? I'm not a believer, and again, I know I'm getting very esoteric here, that an inability to describe something in a commonly understood word precludes the speaker from understanding a concept. I do believe abstracts are possible. I accept the theory that the majority of people are not very good at abstract thinking, which is why propagandistic limitation of language as dealt with in George Orwell's 1984 is very, very powerful. This is freaking heady. And I, I know that this is like, what does this have to do with Death Stranding? Um, this is why. Death Stranding is the further you get into it, a philosophical treatise on the importance of adult play. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to try to explain it because that'll be spoilers. Um, and if you want spoilers, watch Twitch because we're going through it. But the, the, the journal entries, the, the data, the interviews, the emails, all that stuff, the stuff you don't have to read, um, really gets into actually quoting certain philosophers that Hideo Kojima apparently really likes um, and explains the mascot for, um, for Kojima Productions, which is a character, the little, the little skull-faced guy um, that he calls Homo Ludens. Now, that isn't a comment about gay people, Homo Human ludens as opposed to homo erectus man who plays and my phone is ringing um he he references a dutch philosopher by the name of johan huizinga and um who is who is one of the founders of modern cultural history and he really goes into it i'm not going to spend too much time but the whole thing is you you start to realize that what's kind of going on in the game it's almost a defense of video game narratives where the idea is if man does not play and man i mean human if humans don't play they are essentially just tools for whatever system they're within so um play is essential for individuality is essential for self-actualization is essential for true humanity that's what the game is about and so if you just go from point A to point B, the literal thing that Sam, Sam Bridges is supposed to do in the game, if you just take it literally, literally, it's not going to be very fun. But if you make that journey from point A to point B a game, then it's really fun. And all of a sudden it infuses, it infuses meaning into the journey, into the task. And I really think that one of the things um, Kojima is saying in the game, metaphorically, is that that's the difference between sanity and insanity. That's the difference between um, being a tool and having a purpose. 
Now, none of this yet, and I'm pretty far in. I'm almost at the last city. Um, uh, Twitch people, Twitch viewers will watch me get BB back. It's fucking shit slog getting up to that area. But um, yes, I am almost at the end. And this has made sense to me slowly unfolding, but I was never lost in the game. But that's because I have an understanding of metaphor. If your um, understanding of, of art, understanding of literature, understanding of culture is strictly at the level of meme, you're not going to get the message. And a lot of people are at that place. Why? Because postmodern criticism is all about meme, not metaphor. It's all about taking one idea and ripping it away from all other contexts, just going, this idea is literally real and nothing else that may inform that idea matters. I can, I can show this, this is real to me, therefore it is real. It has literal meaning. It does not just exist in my brain. The entire idea of a trope being inherently bad is a meme that is popular and wrong. The idea that a game must validate you in some way instead of challenging you is an idea that is popular and wrong. Uh, the idea that a game must be fun is up for debate because one would say the purpose of a game is to be fun Challenging, yes, challenging is a form of fun. Having your assumptions questioned is fun for a, lot of, for a lot of people. But if that's not fun for you, why would you play it, right? That's more of a gray area. But we have too many hallmarks of all types of art criticism that are popular and wrong. And that is the problem with the idea of memes disseminating based on popularity instead of rigor. And it's a real issue because we went through that period in games and I'm hearing less and less of it now of that person has something important to say. As if individuals on their own can determine the importance of a statement and one statement is inherently more important than another statement. We're not going to know that for a couple of decades. We got to see what lasts. Popular does not mean important. Not necessarily. Does not equal. Sometimes they are the same. But not always. Sometimes an important idea has to originate in some obscure Greek or, or Dutch philosopher and has to trickle down into the public consciousness in the form of a populist like Hideo Kojima or Jordan Peterson. And that's obviously an important call, so I'm going to cut this short. But I personally think that this focus on meme, this focus on easily digestible, quick, popular understanding in video, I used to be an adventurer like you once and then I took an arrow in the knee, is crushing metaphorical understanding of games. And this isn't a defense of games only as art. I think games that are super stupid still have their place. That's its own form of art. I believe games are art, but games are also games. They are not static things. And that's why metaphor is so important. A metaphor is something you work with. A meme is just something you absorb and repeat. So I'm really interesting on uh, really interesting in your thoughts of this. Um, sorry to cut this short, but I really need to find out who's calling me. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com/slash Leanna K. Thanks for watching.